turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, please. The book of Philippians. Genesis, Exodus, Philippians. All right. You may wonder what school I went to. All right, Philippians. I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, But I Want a New Couch. But I Want a New Couch. Amen. You understand what that means by the end. The book of Philippians. Let's go to the Lord one more time. We have one more time tonight before this day is over, this Lord's Day, to allow the Lord to give us what we need to have. The Lord worked on my heart during the testimony of Brother Pollard just an hour ago about something that I was thinking about concerns the future of our church. Not something mind-shattering, understand, just something that I needed. The, the Lord has something that you need tonight. And let's be open. Let's all be open. And ask God, this, this one, one last time, this Lord's Day, to put something in our heart to change us to be conformed to his image. Father in heaven, I ask that you would work. I thank you for the precious word of God as we think through truths that are just so clearly spoken in the scriptures. I pray that you would use them to change our lives. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for changing us. Thank you for caring about us. And Lord, thank you for the, up, the missionary update that we received already. I just ask that you would... Um, care about this people like a shepherd you would lead us to those changes transitions through the transitions in our life i pray that you would speak to us please from your word tonight in jesus name amen we are in the middle of the sin series now there are certain bad sins that we identify right away lying and stealing and impurity you're going to hear some feedback tonight because I've lost the windscreen on top of the microphone. So you're going to hear every once in a while something that sounds like this. All right? You, brought, you have an extra one in your pocket, brother? <laughs> <laughs> he, he stole this one from Hagerstown, Maryland. <laughs> Will you tell that brother in Hagerstown, Maryland that uh, we hope he finds one eventually? All right. I hope that it fits ours here. Just technical difficulties. If it falls off in the middle, don't laugh. There's certain things that we consider bad things, lying and stealing and purity. There's other things, though, like what we preached on last week, things like worry that are so common in believers' lives or in the life of a church that they're hardly considered sin anymore. It's almost an inevitable thing that's going to happen in the life of people in the church. Today I'd like to preach about one of those things that perhaps you think is inevitable. Perhaps you don't look at it as a sin the way that you should, and that is the sin of discontentment. Discontentment. Would you all say that with me, please? Discontentment. One more time. Discontentment. I'm preaching this sin series from a biblical perspective. And I want to be honest with you, God is teaching me through this. I grew up in classic fundamentalism, and I'm great. I'm, I'm glad for it. I grew up in an independent, fundamental Baptist church, you know, with all the things that go along with it. And I'm, I praise the Lord for that. I'm glad. I'm not ashamed of that at all. But there were certain perspectives as we grew and as that church grew and as Pastor Benny Moran uh, grew in that church that he uh, taught us, he preached from the Word of God, and I have seen the Word of God that to me have been such joyful principles, joyful truths about this matter of grace. We walk by grace. We do not maintain our relationship with God by clean living. That maintained relationship is done by His grace. I praise God for that. My relationship with God is maintained by the blood of Christ. I am justified. I am called a saint of God. Now it's my privilege to, day after day, to be sanctified, grown into that label. I am labeled justified. I am a saint of God. You're a saint of God through Jesus Christ. And I'm growing to be what God has already declared me to be. It is a growth of liberty, not limitation. It's a growth of godliness, not God's grudge. It's a growing process, not a continuing frustrated God mad at his children process, as some would teach or some would act like. If I had to maintain, and you had to maintain, God's attitude towards you on a daily basis, frankly, God would always be mad at you. And I think we need a little bit of a change in perspective biblically understanding this. There are different thoughts that come to a person's mind, a Christian's mind, when they hear the sin of discontentment. You may think of thoughts of your present life circumstances, discontentment. Maybe your spouse or your job or your finances or possessions or your house or location or whatever it would be. Though we 
will most certainly talk mostly about possessions tonight. I believe the Word of God will resolve many discontentment areas, other problems in your life, that may be minor problems or things that we won't even mention, if you'll hear the Word of God concerning this matter of discontentment. Discontentment. Should we not want to improve our economic condition? Discontentment. Is it wrong to want more? Is it wrong to desire something and save and to get it? Is it wrong to want a new couch? Does it matter if the reason for wanting that new couch is that there's a split in, in, in one of the uh, pillows or that you just want a new color? Is it wrong to have less or to have more? Is it more spiritual to have more? Is it God's will that I ever have less? Is it God's will that I ever suffer need? Should a person in a bad situation be content about it? Financial discontentment is the number one reason for divorce right now in our world. Discontentment leads to jealousy and jealousy of other people's possessions, wishing that you had what they have. Discontentment leads to accusations, a lot of times of wives towards husbands who are not doing enough to give you what the person across the street has. It, it leads to insecurities in you husbands that you feel like you can't provide well enough or, or maybe everything that your wife would want or everything you would like to give to your children. It leads to accusations about God, that maybe God has not taken care of you the way that he really should. Discontentment leads to buying one credit to keep up with the Joneses, which we have three at least families of Joneses here. I'm talking about every one of them. <laughs> it, uh, it deals with keeping up with the Joneses, which, by the way, that is a term that we have coined in our society in America because they are an unreal people. It's just an unspoken standard of luxury called the Joneses that... Somehow we feel compelled in our homes that we have to have, and our children remind us that we should have these things, because after all, Daddy, everybody else does. Families feel a certain pressure when they do not have the certain standard of the Jones possession. Well, I, come, I call you tonight to the word of God about discontentment. What saith the scripture? What saith the scripture? You know, I'm not talking to you uh, tonight from the most popular text on this subject. I have a message on 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 6 through 10, which I would really encourage you. I'm going to say it again because I, I would really like you to go home, and maybe tomorrow's devotion time will be on that passage. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6 through 10, is probably the premium passage to preach on about contentment. You remember it, but godliness, say it with me, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, It's a classic passage. It goes on and talks about if you're rich and this world's good, that you be sure that you communicate it with other people, give to other people's needs, and talks about how you, you know, all the things. And that's the classic passage. And I would encourage you to look at that. But tonight, I'd like to go to, to some lesser known passages or some passages that are secondary passages on this matter of discontentment in our lives. And I believe that there's some excellent poor points to gain from these, from the scriptures of what God's perspective is. Look over Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This church is spending a lot of time in Philippians 4. I have been there the last couple weeks. I believe the women's Sunday school class is heading there. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Would you stand, please? Would you stand? Let's stand up. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, the Apostle Paul says. Wherein ye were also careful, that means you had a care towards me, a love, a desire to meet my needs, but you lacked opportunity. And then he catches himself in verse number 11. you got to get the, the flow, the tone here. No, he, he, it's like he says, Whoa, wait, no, no, not that I speak in respect of one. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Most often, verse 13 is pulled out of context. I'm not saying it doesn't apply in many areas of your life. Here it applies in the area of having a need and learning how to be content. Would you be seated, please? The context, tell, the context is the Apostle Paul, the servant of God. He had a financial need as he depended on the Lord as a missionary apostle. In verse number 10, we see that the church of Philippi once again met that need. They gave him some kind of large love offering. Then we see at the beginning uh, here the doctrine of, of contentment. 
we see that this will extend to through other books of the Bible. We see as we begin to look at these verses, we'll simply take the teachings here in biblical order and understand what God has to say about our daily lives, about finances, about possession, uh, possessions, about job situations, about this matter of being discontent. You notice in verse number 11 it says, Not that I speak in respect of one. He catches himself. And this is exactly how it is. Look here. He's acknowledging, he's rejoicing in the Lord that they gave him a love gift. He was rejoicing on that. But then he catches himself because he does not want to be misunderstood concerning this matter of someone giving to him something. And this is principle number one. We should not always be talking about the things that we don't have. <coughs> we should not always be talking about the things that we don't have. You know, Paul was clarifying that he was not complaining or dropping a hint to send more. You know, it could be, it could be taken by this church of Philippi that he's kind of given a hint. Yeah, you sent once, you sent again. How about sending some more? He doesn't do that at all. He catches him himself, and he wants them to understand that he is not pointing out the fact that he wants anything. That's good. You know, often, as people, we talk about the things that we don't have, not praising the Lord for the things that we do have. Amen. You know, he was clarifying that he was not complaining or dropping a hint. He was just praising the Lord for their gift, not bringing up the fact that he had other needs. It applies in different ways to families here in this church. Our words should not be always filled with complaints about how God is or is not taking care of us. Right. It's not our position, it's not our place to be doing that. If we continue continually talking about money all the time and what we don't have, it won't be long until our children figure out something. You know what they're going to figure out? It's God's fault. You say, well, that's not what I meant. I never intended it that way. I was just talking about a need or whatever, but that's what will happen. I'm not talking about bringing specific prayer requests. I'm talking about mom and dad and grandparents always <coughs> complaining they don't have enough or something that they want or always whining and complaining about things that God has not given them, and they wouldn't say it that way. That's unspiritual. But just the fact that, oh, I got to get it. Oh, I need this. I need this. You know, last week I was troubled. As I think about this, this phrase, not that I speak in respect of want, Paul goes on to explain that he is not complaining to them about what he needs. Last week I was troubled as our family. We talked about something fun that we did, and one of my children said this. It was talking about, you know, we had a great time doing it, and he taxed one at the end, and it, and it, it was just a, a place. It was very innocent, but it made me think about our conversation. He taxed one at the end, this. We had this, this really great friend. Yeah, and it didn't cost that much money either. It bothered me because I'm afraid my seven-year-old may get the impression that God hasn't taken great care of us. And that perhaps that mommy and daddy have whined a little bit too much about things that we want. And not about how great God has been in our life. All people of God, instead of whining about what God has not given us, how about let's praise him for what he has given us. Amen. You know, we need to uh, realize that our children ought not have memories of childhood that revolve around parents always talking about money and scripting and saving and thrifting. I'd rather them realize that my God was dependable and he met every one of our needs. And I don't know about your Christian life, but my God has taken care of me tremendously. Amen. Much better than I could ever have done without salvation, I'll tell you that. That's the second thought that Paul was saying here about not speaking in respect of one. You know, don't be a person that is always complaining about not having enough. We all have been in trouble where we need to cry out to the Lord. And there's times, honestly, when we humble, we need to humble ourselves and allow somebody else to bear our burden. But Paul would not allow himself to be a person whose conversation always included whining about what he needed or what he wanted. In fact, this chapter, if you read through it, you'll find that Paul focuses much more on the needs spiritually of Philippi than he does his own needs whatsoever. And he ends up the chapter talking about God supplying all their needs spiritually and physically. He would not focus on himself being a whiner. Paul said he wouldn't talk about his wants because he had learned a better habit than complaining. All that the people of God would learn a better habit than complaining about what God has not given us. This, there is an, an issue with, uh, if there is an issue with a, a Christian that over the time, the period of your life, you have for years and years and years, you find yourself always complaining about God's lack of provision, there is a problem somewhere. There is a problem. And I'll tell you, it's not on God's side. Okay? 
That is not a good habit to be in. You should not be always speaking about your want and your desire and what God has not given to you. There are issues that probably need to be dealt with. There are definite times where we humble ourselves, must humble ourselves, and ask for help. And you and I have been there at times. There are times where you, you have got to humble yourself and ask and allow God to provide somebody else to beat your burdens. But it shouldn't be a constant pa pattern. Paul checked himself. He grabbed his speech at, at, at verse number uh, uh, 11, and he says, I'm not going to, I don't want to put out there the fact that I'm always whining to you, Philippi. He wanted to relate to Philippi, this church, and to other believers in a way that wasn't always whining about his own situation. He wanted to spiritually bless them, not always grabbing and whining for them to bless him. There's a second principle here about discontentment. And that is in verse number 11. You notice what it says. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am. Delaware, whatever state, that, that's, that's probably not exactly what it means. Whatever condition, whatever situation, whatever circumstance that I am, therewith to be content. I've learned this. Here's the second principle from the passage about discontentment. The state of our possessions must not determine the peace of our heart. The state of our possessions must not determine the peace of our heart. Whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. You know, that is very good preaching, but extremely hard practice in daily life. The word contentment, it involves two <coughs> ideas that are very, very important. The word itself, broken up, has two ideas. Number one, there's a personal aspect about yourself in that word contentment. Yourself. It deals with your inner man, yourself. But then it deals, the, the second part of the word that is combined in the Greek language is yourself, a personal aspect, and the word enough. Contentment is when you and your heart can say, God, what you've given me is enough. It's enough. I will be content with it. That is a better habit. There is a better habit than complaining. It's learning to say, no matter what situation that you're in, Lord, evidently, you know it. It is enough. It is enough. It's an inner state, not dependent on outward possessions. As a youth pastor, I took a, a missions trip to Romania, a very rural, rural Romania. And there's one thing that I noticed there. The, the people there have, have very little of anything. They really don't. They, they have very little clothes. You know, you see them in the same clothes day after day after day. They had very small uh, homes that were just terribly constructed, not constructed well. But among the Christians, I noticed something. That in the middle of that situation, there was great joy. Great joy. Great happiness. Great praising of the Lord. No air conditioning, no vehicles, little clothing, little health care. Just great peace and contentment among the people. In fact, one thing that stuck out to me is when we would have downtime during after the services or just whenever or when we were with the people, they would naturally, like a magnet, be drawn together and begin singing hymns together. Can you imagine if that would be our case? That would be strange. I was thinking it would be very strange in our churches that just, you know, when things are over or whatever, a group of people just, like, magnet together and just start singing hymns over there in the corner. I mean, that's what would seem strange. To them, it's great joy. They're praising the Lord. Our family had the privilege of ministering in inner city Philadelphia this past week. I think it was Thursday night. We got down there, and this creepy old uh, uh, bar that had been converted into a church. This is Jay Mahalan's church. Some of you remember he's a little guy, speaks a million miles an hour. He's an old Jim. And uh, asked me to come down and preach when they went away. So we got down there on the Thursday. I mean, you know, as far as, you know, things being uh, this way and this, none of it is, it, it, they're just a bunch of people who love God with all their heart, meeting together to worship the Lord with all their heart. And I know those, I know some of those people personally. They don't have two nickels to rub together. They work in inner city Philadelphia. They have hardly anything, okay? You know, their cars won't run. And, you know, I heard, I heard a guy rate one of them. I heard of one, I heard J, one of Jay's relatives, uh, brother-in-laws, as I was standing there bumming a car from another man. All right, that's, that's how it is. You know, we never think about that, guys. You know, afterwards, hey, hey, can I use your car tomorrow? I got a car. You know? I mean, some of the most joyful people praising the Lord that you ever met. Contentment. You know that our peace of heart is not dependent upon our state of possessions. This is the learning that Paul speaks of in verse number 11. Notice verse number 12 picks up on that same education idea. Look at verse number 11. 
He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. Look up here. Contentment is a learning process. I've learned it. And if, if you missed it, he comes back and, and uses a, an education word in verse number 12 also. Look in the middle of it. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. This matter of contentment in your life is something you must work on. You know, we're going to draw tonight to a special invitation at the end. But I want to tell you, it's not going to be a matter of clicking your fingers and boom, I'm content in whatever situation. It has. My house is falling apart. I lost my job. You know, my dog only walks on two legs now. But I am content, okay? It is a learning process. It is a process where God must bring our hearts to be content. It's clear here that the man of God, whom God loved and he cared for, and God blessed him and honored him, this man, Paul, this great man of God, most of you look at him as one of the greatest men biblically in the scriptures. He experienced time of abundance, and he suffered need. He suffered great need. Look at the end of verse number 12. Both to abound and to suffer need. The apostle Paul knew what it was to have great need. How do you reconcile that? You must agree with me. This is something we've got to learn about contentment. You must agree with me that it is God's will sometimes in your life that you suffer in need. Folks, if the Apostle Paul, the beloved Apostle Paul, mature and godly in the faith, God allowed him to sit at times in a prison without any food. You must say, it is the will of God, according to this passage, that sometimes that you have need in your life. This sure is not prosperity preaching, but it is the Bible. Paul was learning the lessons that we must learn. The point of the lesson in verse number 13 is, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Christ empowers me to be strong through the lean times and the needy times and the times that in my perspective, in Paul's perspective, at the end of verse number 12, in my perspective, I don't have enough. And then that popular Verse, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me in the context of not having enough, of suffering, need. I will get through this with Christ. Christ empowers me to be strong through the lean times. There's something obviously missing here in our passage. There is no complaint from Paul. <coughs> do you hear him say, Christ, won't you give me more? It's just, look at the Bible, it's just not there. It's just not there at all. There's no allusion to the fact that Paul feels ripped by God, that he did not get enough possessions or whatever, or even food or even things. There's no allusion to it. He doesn't say, why do I hunger? If I've obeyed you, where are the blessings? He doesn't say any of that. You see here, there is a contentedness that God looks at. you got to hear this tonight. There's a contentedness. Contentedness says that God knows how much I should have at every minute. Right. Paul says, I know how to abound, to have plenty, and I know how to suffer need. In both of those situations, he blesses God. In both of those situations, it was God's will. It was his perfect will. He understood the principle that God ha measures out our possessions or the things that we have or the money or however you want to say it by his sovereign hand at the minute he knows when we should have it or more than that, not should, take that out of there, that he, when he wants us to have it. Sometimes he wants you to suffer in need. You know, I often spoon out the food for my children and as Amy is getting Ellie's plate ready, and my kids hold up the plate, and I take that spoon and spoon it in, the, in there at the dinner table as we come around the family table, and they put it up there, and I plop a thing of mashed potatoes or whatever. I give them a quantity based on my knowledge as a daddy of knowing how much they want, maybe, or how much they will eat so we don't waste any food or whatever. You know, I base it on my judgment. 
But listen to me. When we hold up our plate in life to God, the Lord does not give us what we want. He does not give us what we think we need. Or he does not even give us how much we will eat or consume in possession. He gives us exactly what he wants us to have. And that rings out in these verses. That no matter what Paul had in abundance or in nothing, in, in, in need, he was in real need. That he was submitted to God. That was exactly what God wanted him to have at the time. And he would not complain about it. And he would not speak about it in the sense of whining and complaining and bringing it up to other people and things like that. He would be content. He would say within his heart, self, it is enough. It's not for us to complain about. It's for us to say it is enough and look to Christ for the daily strength to make it on what he has given us. Check it out, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In context, that is not accomplishing something at your job or, or working through something with your children, although maybe it's an application. In context, it's the fact that he didn't have enough food. In context, he, didn't have, he could not make it. But I can do all things through Christ who's going to bring me through the time of need. And he brought him through, leaving him in the need oftentimes, and not immediately. This thing was a strange thing in verse number 10 that he got an offering from Philippi. He often, if you read the Apostle Paul, was in, through the inspiration, God made him write down in terrible situations he was in. And God sustained him in the situations. Wow. I believe sometimes God gives enough and we squander the enough away unwisely. But oftentimes, he just does not give what we consider to be enough. It's what he perfectly wants us to have, but he's breaking us, and he's shaping us, and he's pushing us to verse number 13 to depend on a strength that we, we don't think we can go. He, he brings us to places in our life to stretch us spiritually so we can be conformed to the image of Christ. Verse number 12 is very off, obvious. It says, suffer need at the end. That is Paul's human body definition. His body, he, he suffered need. He knew what it was like to suffer need, this great man of God. But look at verse number 19. It says, But my God shall supply all your need Amen. according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There seems to be a contradiction of, of Scripture. How can it be in verse number 12 that Paul says that he suffered needs, and yet, and yet in verse number 19 he promises that God shall supply all your need according to his riches? The deal is the guy who is defining the word need. In verse number 12, Paul was saying his body defined that he didn't have enough. And in verse number 19, it is God that decides how much enough is to supply your need. In God's perspective and according to his riches, he always supplies exactly what you should have. Amen. And exactly what I should have. And my definition doesn't have much, doesn't really, it doesn't mean anything. My definition of that, of my need. From this verse and verses in 1 Timothy 6 about food and raiment, Matthew 6 that you're familiar with about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, we can conclude this fact, folks. God knows our true needs. He regulates how much he gives us. And he wants us to say within our hearts, it is enough. It is enough. It is enough. That'd be a great place to end the message, but I have one more thing I want you to see. You say, why would it be God's will that his children ever suffer need? Why would God, that doesn't really make any sense. Why would he allow us to suffer need? Turn over to our last passage tonight, Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Back towards Revelation, back your Bible, farther than Philippians. Hebrews 13. I want you to look again at a verse on contentment, 13, verse 5 and 6. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. 
For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Again, in the context of wanting more, of needing more. Verse 5 says that your way of life or your conversation should be without covetousness. That can wanting, desiring, that can be the outgrowth of discontentment, what we're preaching on. Wanting more, greedy, desiring things outside your budget, your ability to have them, outside your right to have them, or even what's good for you, wanting these things, coveting these things. Things God may have given to others, but not to you. God says don't dwell on them. Don't talk about these things, these covetous things that you want. Don't scheme how to get them. Don't complain that somebody else has them, something that God didn't give you within your budget. Don't imagine having them. Don't be jealous of them. But on the flip side, verse number five, be content with such things as you have, the things that I have given you. Say, what God has chosen to give me, it is enough. It is enough. This word contentment in verse number uh, 5 is a different word contentment than the passage in Philippians 4. It means contentment in the way it's sufficient. Sufficient. Which, by the way, is directly linked to it is enough. It is sufficient. It is sufficient. The end of verse number 5 is God's answer to why he may allow you to have need at times. Look what it says there at the end of verse 5. It's a strange connection. And be content with such things as you have. For he, God, hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. This is the answer why God may allow you to have need at times. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Lord is my helper. God may choose to allow us to suffer need so that we may learn that having him is better than the best house. Having him is better than the best car. Having him is the solution for wanting more. Wanting him is the solution for wanting more. You know what the thing is about wanting more? When you get it, you want more. You just want something different. It's, in, it's unquenchable or inquenchable, whichever the right English word is. But you know what? God does quench the need Amen. of wanting. Do you know how temporary happiness comes when you get something that you really wanted? I always think about Christmas time, and you always want, wanted a child as a child that toy, and you get it. Uh, or let's make it your children wants this toy. And your children get it, and they play with it, and it's great. And by the end of the day, they're just playing with a box. Okay? They've lost, you know, they're bored with this whatever it was that they wanted for all these months before Christmas time. You know how that, uh, that satisfaction wears off? We need to learn that there's a greater joy that comes with a different passion, a different desire. And it's connected directly in this verse. It's, it's compared to this, this coveting or wanting other things. There's a greater joy that comes in our personal walk with the Lord. Trusting him with our lives, leaning on him, especially knowing him, desiring him. And scripture makes the connection that we must stop coveting the shoes or the gadgets or the possessions or the toys or whatever. And say, if I have him, it's enough. Right. If I have my fellowship with the Lord, it is enough. I'm not going to pine for more or something different. I want to strongly suggest to you that the Lord holds back from us the things, the, uh, many things of riches, because we tend to replace our fellowship with him with those things. We tend to spend time with those things and not him, or be concerned about fixing or maintaining or repairing the physical things, and we have forgotten that God is our portion. And so sometimes the Lord needs to withhold those things from our life so that we will make the important thing the important thing, and that's God. If I have my fellowship with the Lord, it is enough, and the outward possessions, the state of the outward possessions, really don't matter. The Lord's fellowship never rusts, never goes out of style, it never wears out, it's never boring. It will not get old like that couch that you want so very badly. Tonight, I want to confront you with discontentment in your life. God has given you whatever state you're in. We have a proliferation of different 
salaries and different ways of life and careers in our church. But wherever you are, God has chosen that place for you. It is enough. He wants you to rest on him as your contentment. He has chosen the quantity. He will change your life circumstances from time to time. There's no reason to pray, or there's no, uh, th there's no reason not to pray about what he would have for you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone that is constantly discontent with what God has given them in their life right now. We never can come to the place of really enjoying the joy of life and saying in their heart, despite their possessions, it is enough. Do not complain about God's provision. Say inside, it's enough. Allow your physical need to draw you closer to the Lord. Learn to enjoy your close walk with Him as much as getting that brand new couch. Would you stand tonight with your heads bowed?